We're going to start with the reading of the word. If you would like to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. I'm not a a very long-winded preacher, as long as you say amen. If you don't, he said I could go till six, so praise the Lord. And I usually only use two or three scriptures. We know it's going to be a little long today because I got about 40. Nobody laughed. Praise the Lord. All right. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And whoever captures souls is wise. Are we a church that wants to start winning some souls? Are we a church that wants to get out of comfortability, complacency, and routine and start winning some souls? Maybe you don't feel qualified or called to win souls, but we are. It says when you're baptized in the name of Jesus, it doesn't stop there. It says to go out into the highways and the byways. It says to go out into the Judea, the Samaria, the Jerusalem, the ends of the earth. We have that area right here. You've got family members that aren't in this house today. You've got co-workers, neighbors. You've got the lady in the supermarket who you can tell is just struggling. Get out of our comfortability and allow the Holy Ghost to lead us. It says he who wins souls is wise. Let's start winning some souls today, church. You may be seated. Something that touched me when they were worshiping. It said praise when you don't feel like it. Praise when your father's sick in a hospital bed. Praise when your marriage is in shambles. Praise when you can't get out of bed because all you can do is hold on to depression. Praise when you don't even feel worthy enough to be loved. Because that's when the breakthrough happens. The breakthrough happens when we're willing to praise God in advance for something that we can't understand. When we're willing to praise Him, even though we don't feel worthy enough to even get out of bed. In those moments, you'll get your breakthroughs in your home. In those moments is when you're going to get your breakthrough. Today we're going to talk about a draft day. It's draft day. God's recruiting an army. As we know, it's the end times. People, you've heard that for hundreds of years. Every pastor has preached it since Martin Luther and John Wesley. Everybody's been saying it's the end times. But there's never been signs that have showed that it's the end times until now. It's draft day. We need to start recruiting for an army. Praise the Lord. Right now, what I want us to do is sit there and say, are we worthy to be chosen and to fight in God's army? Would God recruit you? Would God say, I'm, you know, sorry, you're not going to make the cut. Sorry, you know, I, I had plans for you, but you just weren't willing to be coachable. I had a calling for you, but you weren't willing to say yes. Are we willing to be a part of the draft day and be a part of the souls that God's ready to take up into heaven? Are we willing to win souls and help God recruit for the draft day? You know, if, if you've got a sickness or an illness, they might say, you know, you're not qualified. You, you know, you got too much brokenness. Maybe you have osteoporosis today. Maybe your bones ache a little bit. Yeah, we got an amen in the back right there. What if, what if you have spiritual osteoporosis today? What if your spiritual bones are weak? It says that the bones need living water to, to be moist. Why, why would someone have osteoporosis? What is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is when the bones start to become dry, so there's no moisture. So that's how they crack easily. You would be denied from being a part of the army if you had osteoporosis. We don't want spiritual osteoporosis today. So how do we, how do we get rid of it? What do we do? We've got to make sure that we have the living water of Jesus flowing through those bones because that's the only way we'll be worthy enough to even be recruited. That's the only way God will say, I want you for my army. I want you to go win souls. It's when we have the living water of Jesus flowing through us. That's when God says, son, daughter, I've called you to something greater. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. 
Are you ready to go out into the highways and go out into the hedges and go out into your workplace so that this house can be filled? Are you ready to go win souls so that this house may be filled? So that people can receive the same joy, the same love, and the same healing that God's done for you. We don't want to hide our gift. We don't want to hide the blessings God gave us. We got to start using our testimony or there will be souls that are lost because we're hiding behind a hurt. When I was working on this sermon and I was praying to God, I felt like God was saying to me over and over and over, I got a vision. I got a vision for the Black Hills. And I said, oh, Lord, you know, what's the vision? I kept praying. I said, Lord, what do you, what do you want me to tell them? I'm not just going to go to a church and say, God's bringing revival. Every evangelist does that, Lord. I need to know what your vision is. And after prayer and prayer and prayer, God says, I want there to be people who are willing to accept the calling. I want there to be people who are willing to die to their flesh at this altar when they don't feel qualified or called and pick up that calling because that's the only way I'll be able to spread my gospel and the only way I'll be able to win South Dakota where I'm trying to recruit an army for heaven. Are any of us hearing that voice from God over and over? Are any of us hearing that calling from God today? Are any of us willing to come to this altar and sacrifice the lies that the world has placed on us so that we can go out to the highways and to the hedges and start winning souls? We go into Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Are we willing to start going every day to a new house? Are we willing to go every day and come into this house and teach Bible studies? Are we willing to submit to a pastor so that we can be equipped and to go out and to start winning souls through Bible studies? Because if you don't have the equipping uh, knowledge from your pastor, when you go out, you'll be unprepared. But when you're willing to submit and surrender and allow him to lead and direct you, then when you start to go out, you can go out from house to house and start winning souls. You can go out house to house and say, I was so depressed. I was lonely. I went from relationship to relationship because I never understood what love was and then you'll be able to say house to house to house but my God saved me but my God brought me out of that miry clay my God showed me that I felt unworthy I felt like I wasn't good enough and he said get out of the gutter son get out of that addiction get out of that secret sin that you've been doing in the closet son get out of that and come and be made new and go house to house and tell about your testimony we've got to be willing to share our testimony today John chapter 15 verse 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. God says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Just like Pastor Patterson said earlier, if I'm not connected to the branches, then the vine will not have any power source. It will not have the water flow into it. If there's nothing connected to the light, then just like there's nothing connected to the light bulb. If I plug this in right here, we don't get any light. It might be a vine. But it has to be connected to its branches. So just like God is the vine, we have to be connected to him because we are the branches. It says, whoever abides in me and I am him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can bear nothing. How many times have we tried to do it on our own, church? How many times have we tried to find a worldly vice, a worldly fix? How many times have we been in a hobby that distracts us from the calling and the healing God's trying to give us? How many times have we tried to stay so busy that we can't hear the voice of the Lord? We can praise Him all we want. We can repent all we want, and we can ask for things all we want. But if we're in a relationship, we need to yield and allow Him to speak to us also. We can't just praise, repent, and ask if we don't lay in an altar and yield and listen to the voice as He leads and as He guides us. Because it's says for apart from me you can do nothing you might want to win souls you might want to be a light you might want to show people that they're loved and they're worthy but you can't do it unless you're connected to the to the vine the branch will rot and wither if it's not connected to the vine oh thank you lord it goes on to say in acts chapter 22 verse 15 Acts 22, verse 15, it says, For you will be a witness from him to every one of what you have seen and heard. Have you seen some miracles? 
Have you seen some restoration? Have you seen families restored? Have you seen marriages restored? Have you seen people healed? Then we got to start going out and telling people what we've seen. We can't rely on a pastor to be the only voice that this town hears. We can't be waiting on him to go and win souls and pray, Oh, Lord, I'm glad the church is filled. Pastor delivered the message. It says that we have to go out. Everyone has to go out and tell of what we've seen and what we've heard. Pastor said I had a testimony that connected to the fact that I believed he was 12 years old and married in India. And, and it wouldn't make sense to most, but my mom was 12 years old when she was pregnant for me. She had me at 13 years old. So for me, it made sense. I said, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe he was on the mission field. It, 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 most people would not have thought that's possible, but for me, it made sense. Because for me, I had that testimony. I, I thought maybe we could relate in that testimony. Are we willing to go out and relate with people and use our testimonies? It made sense to me because I was able to connect with it. Somebody might be able to make sense and connect with your brokenness. They might be able to connect with the place that you once was to where God's brought you out from. But if, if I'm not willing to share it, then no one will know the place that God brought me from. They'll think, wow, this preacher's nice dressed. This preacher's eloquent in the way he speaks. But they'll never know the place I once was. They'll never know that my mom was nine years old, addicted to drugs, had me be, and, and my grandfather tried to get me aborted, so she ran away and hid in drug houses so that she could have a child out of wedlock and, and then run away because she couldn't raise me. No one will ever know that because I can smile and, and look like everything's okay. I can stand up here and say, oh, it's all right, but you'd never know the place God brought me from. We've got to be willing to share with people the place God brought us from. I could have been bound by drugs. I could have been lost in the streets. I could have been living with a, a father who, who passed away when, I was 20, when he was 21 from colon cancer, but it's because he never had anyone but drugs. We, I, I sat for years and I thought, well, he chose that life. He, was, he picked those drugs. But as I got older, I realized that just like any other sin, the enemy attaches to you and wraps those chains around you. We can't be wrapped around with chains if we're wrapped around with the vine of Jesus. So instead of me judging him, I realized as I got older, I need to go out and win those broken souls. That's, my, that's a calling upon me, Lord. A testimony that I was brought from that I need to now go out and show people that they're worthy even in their brokenness. While they're hurting and they're finding a vice from the world, I need to show them the only vice and the only healing that they need is in an altar. We go on to Acts chapter 22, or Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I, I, I usually only use two scriptures like I said. Now we're at about 9 or 10. Just bear with me. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you will receive power. As a child, we want to receive power. We want to be a superhero when we're a kid. We want to we be able to fly. Maybe you want to have super strong arms and you can be like the hawk. We can have that power today. We can have the power to lay a hand on a forehead and someone receives the Holy Ghost. We can have the power to lay a hand on their forehead and there's healing in the body. We can have the power to see a broken marriage and by faith lay our hands on them and pray and their, the marriage is restored. But it means we have to have the Holy Spirit. It says the power is when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit today, when, when I'm done preaching and the altar call happens, don't leave this house until you do. Don't leave this house until you've laid all the things at this altar that have stopped you from receiving the Holy Ghost. Until you've laid at this altar all of the bondage and burdens that have stopped you from going out and being sent forth with the power that comes with the Holy Ghost. It goes on in that verse to say more than just have, have the Holy Ghost. It says you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. If I didn't have the Holy Ghost, I'm not called to be the witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Because I couldn't do it without the power. When the enemy attacks me, if I didn't have the, the God living within me, I wouldn't be able to withstand the enemy. But because of the Holy Ghost being within me, I have the power to, uh, to deny the attacks of the enemy. When the enemy tries to throw sleet on the road so I can't make it here and deliver the message, our vehicle drove right off into the ice and drove right back up onto the road. That ground could have been soft and we could have been delayed. But God, God made sure that ground was feasible and easy enough for us to drive right back up onto the highway because he had a word. We had the Holy Ghost. We had the protection over that vehicle. You might not be sitting in this house today with your mother, with your father, with your spouse, whoever you've been praying for. 
but through the power of the Holy Ghost, you can be the witness to them over and over, and they'll end up in this house. You can be the witness to them over and over, and they will end up in this house. I was writing this sermon, and I, I, I told you I had a vision from God, and I've only had that happen two other times. But he, he says, I don't want addition. I want multiplication. I don't want you to go and win one coworker and wait until you're done winning them to go and win another family member and wait until you're done. He says, I want you to empower them to win someone else. I won't want you to be the only one teaching Bible studies. I want you to empower the church, to the entire church, to be teaching Bible studies. Church, you might not feel like you're at a place where you're worthy to teach Bible studies, but, but David didn't feel worthy to lead the people. But Solomon wasn't worthy to lead the people. Oh, none of us are worthy, but through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Ghost, that's how we'll win the souls. We might have all the brokenness going on in our own life, but when God says go teach the Bible study, that's how the multiplication will happen. Because once I teach one, then they can go out and teach another and another. And that's when that baptismal will have a line because people will say, I want to take the name of Jesus upon my life. I'm done carrying my baggage. I'm done carrying my bondage. Let me be washed under the water in the name of Jesus so I can come out and leave it all under the water. That's the vision I saw for South Dakota. He says, once we stop worrying about addition, we'll see multiplication in the preaching points. Once we stop worrying about addition, we'll see multiplication in the saints. Once we stop worrying about one soul at a time, God, I'm ministering to them. I'm trying, Lord. Once we empower them enough to know they can go and win someone else, they can grab what God gave them and they can go and give it to someone else. That's when the multiplication will happen, not just for the Black Hills, but for all of this South Dakota land. Outreach is great. Outreach is great. You can go and win your co-workers. You can win your family members. I said that a moment ago. Outreach is great. But if I stop with outreach and I don't forget to do a little inreach, make sure each and every one of us are doing all right so that they can be winning souls also. Go and touch your brother and say, are you okay? Right, well, what kind of, I can see your smile isn't what it was last week. I can see there's a little bit of tears in your eyes after we were praising. So you must be going through something, brother. So how about we go get some lunch on Monday? You know, I, I've got to work. I'll get dinner with you. I, I don't have the money. I'll pay for it. You might not have the money to pay for it. Grab a coffee with them. Find out what they're going through. Take care of the body within so that they are empowered and willing to go out and win souls. If the body's so broken within, we're one body, one mind, and one accord. If my arm is broke here in this house, then it will never be able to grow as one body. We have to take care of the body so that they can go out and win the soul. Think about it today. Have you called someone in this house and asked them how they're doing this week? Have you called them and said, what are you going through, brother? I know you've been praying for your for your grandkids. Sister, I know you've been praying for your grandkids. If I don't give her a call and say, I'm praying with you, then we're not one body, one mind, and one accord. If somebody's missing in this house and I think, you know, I wanted to reach out to them and see how they're doing, but I was just too busy all week. You think God says that to us? Well, I was just too busy to answer your prayers. Sorry. I was just too busy to give you that breakthrough. I was just too busy to step in and heal you. That's how we are with our brothers and sisters. We find that we're too busy to win souls, and we're too busy to take care of the ones that are already in the house. We'll never be able to win souls unless we can also take care of the ones here in the body. We can't fight alone. We have to win souls with a purpose. I started this sermon with, it's time to start recruiting for God's army. But it's with a purpose. The army recruits with a purpose. We have to recruit with a purpose to start a spiritual battle against the enemy. Church, you, you get asked this a lot, but are you hungry for revival? All right, there's four people ready for revival. Praise the Lord. Are you hungry for revival, church? All right. Where does revival start? Does it start here in the church? It starts in your heart. Once the revival starts in your heart and you don't care what people think when you're up here praising, you don't care if you've been weeping in the altar for three hours because you're interceding for your family. You don't have to say, well, I hope they don't see me that way. I'm going to intercede for my family until I can't get up from the altar. I'm going to intercede for my family until I feel like I'm bleeding because I've been weeping so long in the altar. I want to be dehydrated because of how many tears I've let fall on this altar. That's when people will see breakthroughs. That's when they'll see the revival. 
You say, oh, I want revival, but you don't want to get out of the routine. Oh, God, I want revival, but you want to sit in your comfortable posture of praise. God, I want revival, Lord, but you don't want to get up and go pray for your brother that you know is struggling. God, I want revival, but you don't want to come up here and put something in the offering plate that God told you to. Oh, I want revival, Lord, but you don't want to serve, and you don't want to grab a hold of your calling, even though you know God told you you're called to go and win souls, but you think maybe that was meant for pastor. Maybe that was meant for Brother Scott. Maybe that was for Brother Sherwood. It wasn't for me. No, God called each and every one of you. But you say, we all just agreed we wanted revival. We all agreed we knew it was in the heart. Well, then why don't we come and lay down some of those things that have been bothering our heart in this altar? Why don't we make sure before we leave this house today, our heart isn't bound up by chains of the enemy? Why don't we come and make sure our heart has some wounds that are healed? Maybe it's been a wound you've carried since you were just a little girl or a little boy. Maybe your father didn't love you right. Maybe your mom wasn't there. But unless you get that healing from that wound, you'll never be able to have the revival in your heart. Unless you can get the healing in this house at this altar, then your heart will never be ready for revival. I want to see a revival. In the church today. I want new life to bring new life to this city. I want new life to show people that they can have new life in this city. Hallelujah. But you can't do that alone. We can't have one person in revival. We can't have two in revival. We can't have, we need a whole body in revival. It's contagious. It's, it's like having a disease that is, all you have to do is cough and everybody gets COVID. The revival is contagious because when somebody comes to this altar and they start praising God for some reason, they might not have a reason to praise him. But when they take a lap around the room, that revival is contagious. That praise is contagious. When somebody starts to praise him and they don't even know why, then somebody else gets up and they start to praise him. When somebody else in him somebody else gets up and says i want my breakthrough i want my revival i want the revival for my spouse i want the revival for my mom i want the revival for my neighbors but it's one that will start that revival uh, that contagious revival and then two and then three but you can't keep praising the same way you do church you can't keep praying the same way you do church you pray over and over you have 52 Sundays last year you prayed for that family member. But did you ever intercede for him? You had 52 Sundays you came in the house. You had good fellowship. You ate wonderful scotcheroos or macaroons, whatever my father-in-law thought they were. He thought that was the squarest macaroon he ever had. But you can come in this house and eat as many macaroons, as many scotcheroos. You can laugh, smile, show joy, pretend like you care about your brother for an hour and a half, and then not talk to him all week. But until you come in here and start to pre-service prayer like you want a revival. Until you can come in here and say, I want to empower my brother and pray with them in unity. I want to lock hands because I know what they're going through and I'm going to pray in unity. Maybe your spouse doesn't feel like they want to be in the house today. Go and lay hands on them and pray. But if they can't see you outside of church the same way you act inside church, that's why they don't want a revival in their home. If your friends look at you and they can't tell that you're a man or a woman of God, then why would they want this Jesus that you serve? If they look at you and they know what you cuss and you talk like when you're not in the house of God, then why would they want to serve this God? You say, I invited them to, I invited them to service over and over, but you know, the Lord's just going to have to do it. No, they've got to see Jesus in you. Once they start to see Jesus in you, and you invite them, and you keep inviting them, and the one time they show up, you're not even worried they're in the pew, because you're just here in the presence of the king, and you're worshiping, you're running, you got to get, I, you know, see, when I come to church, I buy these heel plates on my shoes. You think, why in the world would I need heel plates on my shoes? You think this evangelist is nuts, he's walking around with no shoes on. But if I want to praise God so hard that the heel plate of my shoe starts to wear out, I want to praise God even when I don't feel like I have something to praise him for. I want to praise God when I don't even feel worthy to be in his presence. Oh, can we just praise him for a second, church? Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you right now for answering prayers in advance, Lord. Thank you for answering prayers in advance, God. Thank you for showing us that we're worthy, God. Thank you for giving us a hunger for revival, God. Oh, I think some people are ready to see a change. I think some people are done with the routine.
I think some people are sick of complacency. I think some people are done being comfortable in the house of God. Jesus never said, I'm going to pull up my chair, sit down and see the masses. Maybe they'll get their miracle. He got uncomfortable. He served. He got on his knees as a servant and washed feet. Are you willing to serve your community? Are you willing to serve your brothers and sisters? Are you willing to serve and be the lowest of the low in this house? Because that's when God says, you'll be humble enough to be used. Oh, thank you, Lord. That revival's contagious, like I said. So if you got a revival in your heart and you go home to that spouse or that child or that neighbor or, or a roommate that might not have the same revival you do, when you take that revival into your home, it's contagious. When they can see there's truly a God you're serving that's done something for you, that's given you a new joy, that helped you get over your anger addiction, that helped you get over your drug addiction, that helped you get over your bitterness. When you walk in the house, they're going to say, I want that same God. And that's going to transfer into your home. Then there's going to be a revival in your home. They might, Like my brother Miles got the Holy Ghost laying in a bunk bed. You can go home, pray for your roommate, your spouse, and your friend. They'll get the Holy Ghost if you have the faith to lay hands on them. They don't have to be in an altar. They don't have to hear a good word from pastor or an evangelist. They don't have to have amazing worship. You can go and lay hands on them. Go to house to house like we talked about earlier and lay hands on them and they'll get a revival. But they have to know that that Holy Ghost is going to come upon them because that Holy Ghost is in you first. I showed you my shoes. I paid, I paid to get these little heel plates put on. Because if I want to worship and I want to run, I don't care if I'm on blacktop or rocks. I want to be able to make sure. That I can shout and run whenever God's done something good for me. Sometimes I don't feel like praising. But the, the song they played earlier, too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. See cancer heal. To see dry bones restored. Have, do any of you feel like your faith's a little dry today? Let's get those bones restored. Maybe you need a physical healing. Let's, let's grab a hold of the healing today. But it goes on to say the prodigal comes home. Do any of you have a prodigal that you've been praying for that you're ready to see home? The verse that I, I hold on to the most, it says, families will be restored. I talked about my calling for a moment I never normally do. It's something I, my wife tells me all the time. Honey, you should share your, your call, your testimony. Talk about your testimony. God's done some good things. But a mom who was nine years old on drugs is now 39 years old. My 39-year-old mom who hasn't been to a service since she was a little girl in Sunday school, been addicted to drugs now for 30 years this year, reaches out to me and my wife and says, I want to come to church. I'm like, oh, what in the world, Lord? I've prayed for years. I thought I gave up praying for it. I thought, I thought maybe God, you know, She's too far gone. That's when I realized that was my human flesh. God said, I heard your prayer, and I'm still working. I'm still working. My mom had to go through a trial that made her feel like she was in the, the gutter, made her feel like she realized there was nothing in the world she needed more than God. I had been praying for 26 years. Free her from that addiction. Free her from that. She came to church, and she got she got in a move of the Holy Ghost upon her. She left, and she felt like she, she said, I don't ever want to smoke again. She said, she just came back now. She got to hear me preach. It was a privilege of mine to be able to preach to my mother. But you know what? We can't stop praying. That song says, families will be reunited. If you've got a family member that you need to see reunited, pray for that today. Because I prayed that prayer two and a half years ago in a church for a friend whose mom was in the hospital and his dad was, was about to pass. He's seen both family members healed now. He's seen the Holy Ghost move in him, and he was refilled with the Holy Ghost that night at 11.30 p.m. at an altar. We, we listened to that song on loop for about an hour, and I kept telling him, God's too good to not believe. God's too good to not believe. Wonder-working God. Way-maker, miracle-worker. And he realized that that was the God he was serving, a miracle worker, a wonder-working God. And now his family is all reunited. And now I've seen it for my own family. Today, before you leave this house, start to intercede for someone in your family. So church, we've, 
We've all agreed that we want to see this revival, but the revival takes action. The revival, if you truly have a revival in your heart and in your home, then the revival needs to be contagious and you need to go win souls. We have to win souls with a purpose. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For that words you speak in anger, for the words you speak when you're just trying to fit in with your friend group, every careless word. Let's let our words build people up. Ephesians 4.29 says, let every word you speak be good and helpful that it's uplifting to the brothers. Let every word you speak uplift the body. Let every word you speak, when people see you, they need to be able to say, that guy serves God. That, there's something different about the God he serves. He, he, he goes to a church where there's a revival going on. People have to see that there's a difference, difference in us. Not just how we dress. They have to be able to tell that there's more than just that. They can't just say, wow, my wife's got long hair and she wears a dress. If she doesn't show the love of Christ, it meant nothing. If she's not filled with the Holy Ghost and that Holy Ghost is pouring out of her, it meant nothing. She might not wear makeup. She might not do a thousand things that is holiness. But if there's not an inward holiness as well, if there's not an inward flow of the Holy Ghost flowing through her, then, it, then the sacrifice means nothing. Can people tell that you're different? Can people even see that you have spiritual fruit? Do you, any of you feel like your spiritual fruit's a little stagnant today? When a fruit is laying against a tree stagnant, the fruit begins to rot. We can't have fruit from God and have spiritual fruit and keep it stagnant or the fruit will begin to rot. You might have been in church 30 years and thought, I've been a saint my whole life. I've got spiritual fruit. But if your fruit's been stagnant, your fruit's starting to rot. We need to make sure that the fruit is ripe so that other people can see the spiritual fruit within us. Fruit grows in multiplication. When I eat an apple and I throw the apple down, there's not just one seed inside. It's multiple. So people see your fruit and they see you lay that fruit down and start to plant it into someone else. There'll be multiplication. That's how we have the multiplication. They have to see that you have the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Sometimes your hobbies, your passions and desires, we need to crucify them at this altar because they're taking our time from God. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Provoke one another or envy one another. We can't be complacent and comfortable or our fruit will rot. We have to seek the love. We have to seek joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because that's when somebody will be able to tell there's something different in them. Does your fruit help someone else grow? We know you, every parent says you have to eat your fruit and vegetables because that helps them grow. Is your fruit... Helping someone else grow today. Do you ever wonder, how can, my, how can my tree grow? How can my spiritual fruit grow when all the little weeds I let into my home are choking the roots? How can I let my spiritual fruit grow when the things I watch at home is a weed in my garden that's going to choke the roots of my fruit? How can I let my spiritual fruit grow and be seen as a man of God with the fruit of the Spirit if I know at home the things I listen to or the, th the jokes I laugh at with my coworkers because I don't want to seem too haughty. So I'll laugh at the jokes. Well, now I keep planting these little weeds in my garden so my fruit's never going to grow because it keeps getting choked out by the roots that are stealing the nutrients. We said we need that living water of Jesus so that we don't have osteoporosis. Our spiritual fruit needs that same living water or the fruit will never grow. So today, before you leave this house, why don't we weed our garden a little bit? Because if we don't start weeding that garden and taking out those little secret things, it's, a, it's just a little piece of grass. I'll get it later. But that piece of grass is going to be contagious. And there's going to be more and more weeds that will take over your fruit to the point where you feel so unworthy to be in the house because you feel like your fruit is rotten. Those weeds need to be cut up, removed, and sacrificed at this altar today. Because, and you might say, what kind of weeds is he talking about? Anxiety, depression, loneliness. If we keep letting those things be planted in our garden, our fruit's never going to grow. Bitterness, anger, 
<laughs> envy, gossip, if we keep planting them, they're going to keep taking away from that love, joy, and peace. Bear with me for just a moment. We're going to come and sacrifice them at this altar today as one body and one mind and one accord. Because if not, we're going to leave the same way we came in. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. He'll hear your prayers today. You might not feel like he does, but if we can grab a hold of that righteousness today, he will hear your prayers. But we have to make sure that we're willing to come to an altar. Why, why is the significance in the altar? The altar is the place that they came and made sacrifices. The altar is the place that death happened, and they could come and kill those things that have been bound upon them for so long. Sometimes an altar is not a place just to come and make amends for your sin. So you, the, the saints that say, oh, my gosh, that person came to the altar four or five weeks in a row. They must be really going through it. When Noah got off the ark, he didn't have anything to repent for. He got off the ark and he built an altar of praise. He said, God, thank you for what you're doing. So when they lead you into praise, come to the altar and shout and dance because David danced. Noah made that altar. They came in the presence of God and they couldn't handle the consumption of the spirit as it came upon them. Come and dance for God. Come and lay it down at this altar of your praise. Come and lay down that sin that you need to give up and allow it to be sacrificed at this altar today. Because we need to get prepared for a spiritual battle. And unless we die to some things at this altar, we'll never be prepared for a spiritual battle. Unless we are willing to put on the armor of God and grab that sword of the spirit and go out in the spirit realm against the enemy, then we'll never be able to be a soldier for the kingdom of God. I want the armor of God. I, I, I study it, and I wonder, I said, oh, man, all of it is defense. God's got a shield, a breastplate. He's got all these different things on him, and it's all defense. I thought, Lord, why is there only one offensive weapon? Why is there only one offensive weapon to go against the enemy? The sword of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. There's power in the Word of God. There is power in the Word of God. It says praying at all times. It doesn't just say to pray at all times. It says to pray at all times in the Spirit. If we were praying in the Spirit today, church, then there would have been an uproar. It, it, like Pastor Miles said, the Spirit is contagious. When it blows through, the wind is contagious. So if we were praying at all times in, in the Spirit, then there would have been people running because they wouldn't have been able to contain what the Spirit was doing to them. It goes on to say, with all prayer and supplication to the end, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints. Remember how I said we're one body. It says make supplication for your saints. Pray for your brothers and sisters. But that's the only way you'll be able to fight that battle. They locked arms and they stood there ready to go against the enemy. They had the only thing they had was their sword. We only have a sword to go against the enemy. We have the sword of the spirit. Brother Sherwood, could you come here for a moment? Praise the Lord. He didn't need that. If I come into your house, Brother Sherwood, and I'm coming to attack your family, and all you have is a butter knife, you think it's going to stop me? There you go. It's good. I might eat the bread. If I come to attack his family and all he has is a butter knife, the enemy's going to get there. If the enemy comes to attack your family over and over and you're not prepared with the sword of the spirit and all you pull out is a butter knife, the enemy's going to win. But when Brother Sherwood grabs that sword and he knows he can defend his family because he's been in the word of God and he says, I have the sword of the spirit. When the enemy comes to attack, he'll be ready to stop me. I won't be scared of the butter knife, but I'll be scared when he raises the sword to me. And he says, I'm ready to defend my family. I'm ready to defend my faith. I'm ready to defend my brothers and my sisters and the other saints in this house. Does anyone else want to be like Brother Sherwood today and stop worrying about the butter knife and grab the sword? Grab the sword of the spirit and start to protect your family. Make sure the sword is sharp. It's, they said that it's got to be sharper than a two-edged sword. You've got to be ready to go against the enemy. Brother Sherwood, when I see that that sword is sharp, the enemy's going to start backing away. When the enemy sees that you've got that sharp sword and you said, that's my neighbor. 
That's my coworker. That's my mom and my family member, and I'm going to battle for him. He can intercede. They might not be in the church today, but when Brother Sherwood has a sword in his hand and he goes up against the enemy, it don't matter what they're going through. You can intercede on behalf of them. You can intercede on addiction. You can intercede on broken marriages. You can grab your brother's hand. You can grab your sister's hand, and you can intercede for a spiritual breakthrough. Does anyone else want to intercede with him today? We're going to take a moment. Grab your brother or sister's hand and take a moment to intercede with them. To intercede. Grab, a, grab the sword of the Spirit today and intercede in war against the enemy. Don't pray alone today. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. We praise you for what you're doing. We know that fruit grows in multiplication, but you have to submit and surrender today if you want to walk out of here different. If you want to walk out of here different, stand up, raise your hands, and submit to God and say, I'm done with the depression. I'm done with the loneliness. Make sure your sword is sharp enough to remove the weeds out of your garden. Church, this altar is open.